This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles. We win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Stephen Kreisick of the Lotto Jumbo team as well. And Adam Yates of Orica Green Edge and Anthony Turgis, who had a little bit of a tumble as he headed in towards Scarborough, but stayed on his bike. Great Britain have won their first medal. It was Adam Peaty in a world record time, breaking his own world record. She punches the air and she crosses that blue finish line. The world champion of 12 months ago, who finished second here last time around, has won it. The Athletes' Village is not a place for fighting. I've never heard that ever in Olympic and Paralympic history. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast covering the Games all the time, rather than once every four years. I'm John. And I'm Michael. And coming up in this episode, to misquote an old school favourite, we've got all the worlds in our hands. (laughs) Well, swimming, diving, cycling, triathlon and athletics. Oh, and we're going to talk about a man called Tom Daly shortly too. The latest results for Great Britain coming your way. And after my weeks at Wimbledon and a sojourn to Paris, Thomas Bach, the IOC president. Is he right about Russia and Belarusian athletes? Also, after that 50,000 strong crowd for the London Athletics Diamond League meeting at the Olympic Stadium, the London Stadium, why are we still going on? about bringing athletics back to Crystal Palace. Yes, lots to debate on the pod in this episode. And you can have your say too at Anything But F on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook, Insta and Threads. It's Anything But Footy on those social media. And you can message us through the website, anythingbutfooty.com. Now, I know when I wake up early on a Sunday morning to a message from my esteemed podcast partner, John Cushing, that <laughs> something huge has happened overnight. And so with some trepidation, I opened that message and the huge news that happened overnight was the return of Tom Daly. He is coming back bidding for a place at Paris 2024 after his son Robbie said that he wanted to see his father compete at an Olympic Games. You'll remember that Tom Daly won gold in the 10 meter synchro event alongside Matty Lee at the Tokyo Olympics. He hasn't competed since. But having gone to the Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs, USA with his son, Robbie, (laughs) he says the direction of his life has changed and he is now looking to try and qualify for the Paris Olympics. Did we know this? Did we think last week when you had your chat in Paris with Mark England that we knew that this announcement was coming up? I think we did. And we mentioned it on social media, on on some of the posts for the last episode of the podcast, that we were told that Tom Daly was still thinking about it. It was volunteered to me as well. I asked a question of Mark, if you can go back and listen to the episode, I asked a question of Mark about the fact that we think that Team GB is is moving on in terms of the the heroes from 2012, if you like, and and there's a whole new team coming through. And I mentioned Helen Glover and Max Whitlock, and he was the one who came through and said, well, actually, what about Tom Daly? He's still considering it. So it was obviously front and centre of the mind last week, um, and they were obviously waiting for him to uh, confirm it. I thought, well, here let's hear, let's hear a little bit of the statement from from Tom on YouTube see where this goes i don't know where this is going to go i don't know if this is just going to be a a completely silly idea of me getting back in the pool or 
it's going to be an opportunity for me to be able to have a bit of fun, see, like do it recreationally without any of the pressure and then see where I go, see if my body is able to get back up onto a diving board and dive any like half decently. I don't know what that's going to look like, um, but I thought that was something worth documenting over the next you know, year. And I guess Paris 2024 is definitely a goal. Tom Daly on the YouTube t- channel confirming that he, he wants to come back to diving. I think he played it quite well, Michael, as well, because he's not saying he's going to go to the Olympics. He's saying, I'm going to see if I can go to the Olympics. And we'll talk about the results that uh, British diving have had in recent weeks. It's not going to be a dead cert that he's going to walk back into that team. No, and I go back to what I said on the last edition of the podcast. Tom Daly is not going to go in that team as a as a mascot, as a flag carrier, as a bag carrier. He will only go into that team on merit. We know that... And we're going to talk about this later with the sport of track and field. We know that places on teams for world championships and Olympic Games are very much hard fought for. We don't send passengers anymore in the way that the lottery funding is distributed by UK sport to the individual national governing bodies. Everyone that is on that team, everyone that is on that plane or that Eurostar to Paris is there on merit and they're there because either they can win a medal, they're there because we think they can reach a final or they're there because they're going to get experience, very vital experience, ahead of a future Games. Mm. So, judging by that criteria, Tom Daly will only be in that diving team, he will only be on Team GB, if they think he is a medal contender or is going to compete at the highest level. And as you say, he's going to face a bit of a battle to get there because the standard of British diving, and again, go back and listen to our last episode with Mark England, who was talking about how... He expects British diving to be one of the real standout sports in Paris. The standard of British diving has gone through the roof. So, Mm. yeah, he's had quite a while out, a couple of years out, Tom Daly. um, But now he'll have 12 months to try try and get himself back in form. And, you know, it would be an amazing achievement for him. Made his Olympic debut at the age of 14 in Beijing. Bronze medals in London and in Rio. That gold in Tokyo, the delayed games. Dad of two now, of course, and aiming for a fifth Olympic Games. Yeah, it will be absolutely incredible. And and again, you mentioned it in the last podcast, Sir Andy Murray could have uh, five Olympic Games. Tom Daly could have five Olympic Games. That's a a heck of an achievement uh, when you think about it. And I remember um, way back in the build-up to 2000 when Sir Steve Redgrave was about to go to his fifth and and could he win a gold and another gold and et cetera, et cetera. But now you think how much... That was just one person that he, he'd, he'd done this as part of his career, Redgrave. But now we've got multiple people who could be going to five Olympics. And, and that, I think, shows the strength of British sport. And it's not just. The Olympics isn't just about athletics. The Olympics isn't just about swimming. It's so much more than that, isn't it? And I know our podcast is called Anything But Footy, but we say this so much that around the world, Olympic footy is really important and people want to win it. And what we've seen in the last 20, 30 years, and you mentioned the lottery, and it's all part of that, is we've just got so much better at different sports. And I can't wait to watch the taekwondo and to watch the judo and to watch us win medals in more sports than we ever do. And I think that has been one of the best things that UK Sport and Team GB have done, is that they've said, let's not just focus on those big sports Let's win it right across and show people, show the youngsters the inspiration that, yeah, you don't have to just be a footballer or an athlete or a swimmer. You can be just as good at kicking someone in the head, as Jade Jones said to us. And also sports are getting cleverer as well. You look at the sport of swimming and they know that relay medals are potentially easier wins, if you like, than some of the individual medals. And we saw that in Tokyo. We saw swimmers sacrificing their own individual event to focus on those relays where they knew that medals could be won. So British sport has got so much smarter. Mm. And I would just mention as well, I wonder what Matty Lee and Noah Williams uh, are thinking right now because Tom Daly essentially, I think, maybe wants one of their places. Uh, they won the World Silver together in 2022, finished fourth at the most recent World Championships. But it, it could be one of those that has to make way. Uh, Matty Lee, of course, who won the gold with Tom in 2021. But, you know, on the surface, I think it's fantastic to see Tom Daly giving it another go. I'd love to see him at the Games. Um, if he does get there, I would put a lot of money on him 
being one of the people carrying the flag into uh, the Olympic opening ceremony. But I, as I said right at the start, it, it's not about that. He wants to go there because he wants to be competitive. Yeah, anything but footy, episode 90. Uh, amazing we're on the 90th. We've done a lot more than 90 uh, podcasts if you, if you go back and listen to it. But officially on the kind of weekly updates that we do, anything but footy 90, Michael has confirmed. He has put it on record that he thinks it'll be Tom Daly carrying the flag at the uh, Paris Olympics uh, along the Seine. Of course, along the river yes. set, you know, not even in a stadium, uh, which will be incredible. Now, you mentioned swimming. World Aquatics Championships have been taking place in Fukuyama in Japan with some standout results for British swimming. Yeah, with all the names that we know, the names of like Adam Peaty and Duncan Scott and Tom Dean, of course, who won a couple of gold medals in Tokyo. It's actually Matt Richards who's coming away from these championships as the the standout performer, if you like. A gold in the individual 200 metres freestyle. Then part of the uh, relay team as well, also winning a gold with Duncan Scott, with James Guy and with Tom Dean in the 4 by 200 metres freestyle relay. Just running you through some of the other medals won by Great Britain at the World Swimming. Tom Dean, a silver medal for him in the 200 metres individual medley. Uh, Duncan Scott also winning a medal. Also, we've got Lauren Cox winning a bronze in the 50 metre backstroke. Tom Dean in the 200 metres uh, individual medley, as I mentioned, and Ben Proud in the 50 metres freestyle. And then there was, and we said, didn't we, a few moments ago, these relay medals that are up for grabs, a bronze medal in the mixed 4x100 metres freestyle relay. Uh, Matt Richards, Duncan Scott, Anna Hopkin and Freya Anderson and also picking up medals because they swam in the heats. Jacob Whittle, Tom Dean and Lucy Hope. Amazing, isn't it, that Tom Dean was only used in the heats, a double Olympic gold medalist. It does show the strength in depth. Talking of which, the team, uh, the diving team, came away from Japan with three world silver medals and eight Olympic so-called quota spots qualified as well. In other words, there will be a Team GB diver in those events. It started on day one with a silver in the men's three-meter synchro for Jack Law and Anthony Harding, also booking their Olympic spot. We know the team still needs to be selected, but surely Lewis Tolson and Andrea Spendalini. The 2022 European champions will be going to Paris after winning British women's first. That's British women's first ever 10 metre synchro world championship medal. Another silver and another Olympic spot. And Scarlett Mew Jensen and Yasmin Harper teamed up to win another silver in the women's three metre synchro as well. I've got an issue on Wednesday, the 31st of July 2024. 17 gold medal events up for grabs. And my issue is this. Diving between 11 and 12 in Paris, the women's synchro 10 metre platform final between 11 and 12, we think probably featuring Lois Tolson and Andrea Spendolini Syriex. But on the same day, triathlon, which they're anticipating will finish around 20 to 11, it is the women's individual final where the likes of maybe Sophie Colwell and Georgia Taylor Brown could be taking part. Can I get from the triathlon that finishes at 20 to 11? To the diving, which is 8.4 miles away, I've checked. <laughs> but they're saying a 24-minute drive time. Uh, the diving, which begins at 11 o'clock. I've got that. I'm going through each day at the moment, and that is that is troubling me right now. Whether I can get to triathlon and diving and I think, cover both of those. I think you might have day. to. I think you might have to split yourself in half. Yeah, I think what well, half of me will have to go diving, half of me will have to go to triathlon. Um, staying with the World Aquatic Championships, though, you know I'm a big fan of artistic swimming. Kate Shortman made a British sporting history, winning the first World Championship medal for Britain in that sport. The 21-year-old produced a stunning display uh, to bag bronze in the solo free final. She'd previously won the European Games bronze with, with Izzy Thorpe. So terrific result there for artistic swimming. Mm. And details, by the way, on this week's World Para Swimming Championships, which have just started as we record in Manchester. We'll have all the details, all the winners, all the medalists on the next edition of The Pot. Can't believe you got through that whole artistic swimming and didn't mention synchro. Now, from the pool to the road track arena this week, the World Cycling Championships start in Glasgow. You know the drill if you're a regular listener to anything but footy. All World Championship cycling events together in one place for the first time ever. Bigger than the Glasgow Commonwealth Games of 2014. You can check out lots of our previous podcasts on this if you want to get in the mood. And it comes as British Cycling and Lotus have teamed up with Hope Technology again to deliver 
deliver the brand new bike for the track cycling team this week and the Paris Olympics next year. The bike has been meticulously designed and optimised, that's what it says on the press release, to deliver improved track performance at the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. And you will see it in action over the next few days in Scotland. A bittersweet weekend, I would say, for British triathlon. Firstly, there was news that Leeds will not be hosting a round of the World Championship Series next year. Uh, Leeds, of course, has been a fantastic host city, a host venue for that World Triathlon event over many years. It was Sunderland, though, actually, and the beach at Roker that was the host this time around. No Alex Yee, Johnny Brownlee or Sophie Caldwell. I was reading quite a lengthy post on social media, actually, from Sophie Caldwell, who was explaining why she wasn't there and why she was prioritising the test event in Paris. No Georgia Taylor Brown, of course, and more on that in a moment for her. Uh, but despite the fact that some of those big names, some of those well-known names of British triathlon weren't in Sunderland for the World Championship Series. Uh, Great Britain did win the mixed relay behind, yes, you know, France. <laughs> Jessica Fullegar, who was in for the injured Olivia Matthias, Barclay Izzard, Beth Potter and Max Stapley, all part of that team. The French team, incidentally, included Pierre Lecora and Cassandra Pogranda, who both won the individual sprint events the day before. Wow. And whilst Beth Potter who you'll recall won for Team Scotland in Sutton Park at the Commonwealth Games 12 months ago, didn't enter that individual sprint. She still tops the women's ranking. So what have I been saying about Great Britain against France mm. in the mixed team relay triathlon? It's going to be quite the event next summer. Yeah, and after another successful few weeks for Great Britain, we do wish a friend of the pod and Olympic champion Georgia Taylor-Brown all the best. She's currently out injured and out of action in the triathlon so we say to her recuperate rest enjoy and get ready for paris georgia because michael is depending on you now <laughs> this is anything but footy the olympic and paralympic podcast and talking of paris did i mention i was there last week well <laughs> it's interesting so much of the talk is still dominated by Russia and Belarusian athletes competing. Organisers say they'll welcome anyone from the, uh, that the IOC allows, and the Olympics president, Thomas Bach, saying, as we said in the last episode, it's down to the federations to see how it plays out with individual or neutral athletes competing. Now, some are doing it, and some aren't. Now, you'll know that athletics and swimming, for example, uh, have not allowed people to compete. Gymnastics are going to do it, from the summer, I believe. Uh, fencing has been doing it. And, of course, tennis has been doing it. And after my two weeks at Wimbledon, when I saw both uh, Anya Sabalenka and Alina Svitolina speaking quite honestly about it in person, real people, if you like, rather than just people on the screen or people on social media that you may follow, it got me really thinking that Thomas Bach is actually right when he says, if it's working in tennis, why not the Olympics? But I tell you what it needs to be, Michael, and this is where I think the big difference needs to be. It needs to be like tennis. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when I was working as a reporter for the radio, I tried to play my part. At no point did I call Medvedev or Sabalenka Russian or Belarusian. And the All England Club were really clear about it too. And I, I talked about it with lots of different people. There was no mention of neutral or individual next to the names, the players' names. On websites, on scoreboards, it was just Victoria Azarenka. That's all you saw. While all the other players were labelled Cameron Norrie, GB, or Coco Goff, USA. So that it was clear that they were individuals and they weren't attached. And that's why I really think the Olympics can do the same thing. But instead of calling them neutral athletes, which is what they've done with the drugs before so with uh, Russia being banned uh, for the uh, systematic statewide doping uh, that took place and they were banned from uh, certain Olympics and but they could of course compete as neutral athletes under the Russian Olympic flag as well um, that's why I think it needs to be different we need to remove the term neutral because I think that's what we all think is going to happen and actually just try and say these are individuals and there are no attachments. So if they win a gold or a medal, leave the flagpole empty. I think the Olympics have already said that they're not going to allow team events because they are ultimately individuals. And I think you can also put that to where they're staying. The athlete's village is all grouped into different nations. 
the actual individuals competing for those nations could stay in the athletes' village in individual rooms or in a hotel, totally separate, just like any other sporting event that we've seen. Maybe that's at Wimbledon or wherever. So that's what I really think the Olympics could allow it to happen that way. And a plea to all commentators as well. Don't don't talk about the nation. Let's just ignore it and concentrate on the on the sporting talent and don't count how many medals they win. They are just ultimately individuals performing and competing themselves. And for me, that is part of the Olympic ideal. And if you look at the ideal, the Olympics, you Google it or whatever, it says it's to promote human rights for all. And I think that is what Thomas Bach and the IOC are really thinking about at the moment. And that's why, having covered Wimbledon and then gone to Paris and seen what it's like, I wanted to sit down and I wanted to say it on the podcast and I've written a blog on it because I just think, as with all things in life, it isn't clear cut. It's very grey. And if we make it individual sportsmen and women competing and not create a pseudo Russian team, then it might and it might just work. And you can read that blog on our website at anythingbutfooty.com. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. Stay with us as we look to the future of athletics in this country next. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. And we were talking, uh, I was talking about Russia and Belarus and Thomas Bach and the Olympics and whether it's the right thing. Uh, Obviously, you can have your say. We'd love to hear from you. Usual social media accounts if you want to get in touch. Now, 50 British confirmed athletes so far will be heading to the World Athletics Championships this summer, including new British record holders Zardel Hughes, Laura Muir, Morgan Lake and Keely Hodgkinson. Some of the people we spoke to at our recent reigning British Championships podcast, Daryl Nita and Jesse Knight, all confirmed as well. Some criticism, though, on the focus that Jack Buckner, the new athletics CEO, UK athletics CEO, has brought in to optimise medal success and the number of top eight places. And British Athletics says the full team will be finalised once they receive world rankings invitations from World Athletics. And athletes who've met the qualification standard and demonstrated current form will be selected. It's really interesting, and I would point you in the direction of Di Green's Twitter account. I think I can see both sides of this argument. Di Green has obviously set out the argument very eloquently about why British athletics should take a bigger team, why the likes of maybe Jade Lally and Lena Nielsen and Josh Zeller, who was fifth in the World Championship final in 2022, in the 110 meter hurdles, while the likes, whilst the likes of Amelia Strickler and others should be in this team, and it looks as though they might get invites um, from World Athletics, but it looks as though UK Athletics might turn down a number of those invites. And Di Green, as I said, has set out the argument about why it's important for athletes to go and experience big events, how it will help them in the future. But Jack Buckner will point, I think, to his CV and his track record and say, look. Look what I did at swimming. I trimmed down the size of the squads. I made us very competitive in the squads that I took to all the major events. Look at what happened in Tokyo. We had a record meet. We had a record gala in Tokyo, and we won lots of medals. It wasn't the same for British athletics. They didn't enjoy that success at the last Olympic Games. So I, as I said, can see both sides of the argument. I think what the athletes require, and this is where I think maybe something has gone wrong here. What the athletes require is that clarification as to why they're not being selected. Because we have spoken at length, we know that there's financial issues at British Athletics. And I actually think an athlete might be able to accept that easier if they're told purely and simply by Jack Buckner or whoever, we're not taking a huge team to Budapest. And the reason is we can't afford to take a huge team. And I have seen, you know, the likes of Amelia Strickler and others say, look, I would pay my own way. Mm. Is it the financial issue or 
is it a performance issue? And I think that's what the athletes need communicated to them, perhaps a little bit better. And that is me just going on what I've seen on social media, what I've seen on Twitter feeds and Instagram feeds. The athletes want to know why. What is the actual reason that they are not going? Now, I can see from that performance point of view, and as, as I said, Jack Buckner did it with swimming. He trimmed down the squads and he got the success. That is, I think, what they're trying to replicate in athletics. So is it the performance side or is it the financial side or is it a combination of both? I think that's what the athletes... And going back to our 50th episode of Great British Bosses, which we recorded with the chair of UK Sport, Dame Catherine Granger, I'm always taken by something she said to us. And it was actually a conversation about something completely different, but athletes just want to know. Mm. They want to have all the controllables in place. So they want to know why they're selected or why they're not selected. What is the actual reason? Don't fudge it. I think it might be a mixture of both, Michael. The fact that you said, is it to do with targets or is it to do with money? Um, I think it's like the first time in 20 odd years that it's the smallest team that we're taking. I, th I think usually we take between 70 and 80. And as, and as I said earlier, it's about 50. But I wonder whether because of the, the resources are just not there to communicate this out properly with with people and and jack has come in and he's had to stabilize it and they've just put on an amazing event at the at the london uh, stadium which we'll talk about in a moment and it, it feels like everything's moving in the right direction but as you say if the athletes ultimately still don't feel like they're being um communicated with in the best way possible then it all it all looks like from the outside as though it's crumbling and I actually don't think it is. I think you let's hope that we will go and win medals at these world championships um, and, 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 and replicate, as, as you rightly say, what Jack has done at British swimming. I mean, after 2012, British swimming was in a hell of a mess. I mean, they, they, they ballsed up their own uh, home games, uh, won a couple of bronzes and, and silver, I think, and that was about it. And they had to rebuild that whole structure. And that's what Jack did. And now, as you say, they're record breakers. <laughs> they're the most successful British swimming team we've ever had in, a, in Olympic history. And boy, wouldn't it be great at LA or even Brisbane in 10 years time where we're talking about British athletics like that? Yeah. And, you know, I think that I agree with the athletes that major championship experience is vital. If, if you're going to turn up in LA or, or Brisbane as a medal contender, it would have been nice to have experienced a little bit of that before. But, you know, there's the world championships. I think there was a team, a British team of well over 100 went to the, the last European championship. So yep. there, there's opportunities there. Commonwealth Games, of course. We yep. know that a lot of athletes don't um, compete at the Commonwealth Games. Arguably, uh, you could make the... The case there, it's the bigger name athletes, the ones that are probably in that World Championship team. But there are other opportunities mm. to come and compete and compete on big stages at major meets. And, you know, it just boils down, as I said, I think, to that, that communication the athletes want to know. So um, it will be something I think that rumbles on and Jack Buckner will probably point to the results that he does or doesn't get in Budapest and you know that might help clarify this going forward um, moving on though on this episode of anything but footy John mentioned once or twice that he's been to <laughs> Wimbledon and Paris this is going to become the new on-running joke uh, taking over from me and the Gold Coast so whilst John was at Wimbledon and Paris I was in Manchester mm. uh, for the British Athletics Championships for very wet British Athletics Championships we've also had the London Athletics meet uh, so the latest state of the Diamond League at the London Stadium the Olympic Stadium as uh, we know it in old money <laughs> Zarnell Hughes broke another record it was always on the cards wasn't it the British 200 metres record he came third uh, behind Noah Lyles uh, in that one and Tobogo of Botswana time of 19.73 meeting was sold out there was 50,000 in the stadium fantastic legacy venue legacy event from London 2012 and the World Championships of 2017. We've got the Europeans coming to Birmingham and the Commonwealth Games Stadium in 2026. We've got the Manchester Community Track that I actually think is a really good venue for the British Athletics Championships as well. It's intimate, the crowd are very close in it. It's quite full. We've been at British Athletics Championships in Birmingham before where there were lots and lots of empty seats. So I think Manchester is a good venue for that. But why then are we still seeing people banging on about reviving Crystal Palace. 
I mean, this is something that you and I grew up in the era of ITV and Channel 4 having athletics in yeah. the 80s on a, on a Friday night, and it was about Crystal Palace. But surely what's happened at Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park means that it's time to let Crystal Palace go. Yeah, effectively, like Gates Head as well, where you, you know your neck of the woods, Michael. Um, it, when I was growing up, it was the, it was a, an amazing place to watch athletics, and yes, Steve Cram still loves it, but you, you had to move on from from Gates Head. And I think if if athletics is what it's trying to do, is trying to put itself in in a place in a sporting world that is jam packed at the moment how much coverage is the world netball getting at the moment in comparison with the world football uh, women's football taking place at the moment the, the there's so much sport on at the moment and athletics is trying to get it into a place where it's it's recognized well then you need to stage it in places where it it, it is a world leading venue and London is a world leading venue. Birmingham showed it was, as you rightly said, at the Commonwealth Games last year. And it's got the Europeans coming. You've got the Manchester track as well, where, as you say, apart from the monsoon, it was a great event for the British Athletics Championships. But what? But literally, why are we talking? Why is Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London? You think, you think he's got a lot of other things to be worrying about at the moment. But he's saying about reinvesting in Crystal Palace. It feels a bit like... Well, it was always great, so let's go back to it. But I will take what Jesse Knight said to you in Manchester at those British Championships and said, I can't wait to go and run at the London Stadium. London 2012, I was there just before it opened, but now I'm, now I'm going to compete myself. Keely Hodgkinson has never competed there. Hmm. These We remember the London Stadium for Mo Farah, Greg Rutherford and Jess Ennis. We don't, there may be Crystal Palace memories for people, but it doesn't mean anything to people outside of athletics. And also, I know it's a heck of a place to get to. It's ridiculous. There, there's about one train line. I mean, look at the London Stadium and the facilities that you've got there and the same with Birmingham, etc., etc. I don't know why we're banging on about it. I really don't. The only thing I would say whilst why Crystal Palace could be saved, why it, could it become like a high-performance centre? So not somewhere that we are staging major events at, but somewhere more akin to what we have in Loughborough or at the English Institute of Sport in Sheffield, potentially, because obviously Crystal Palace was more than just its athletics track. There was the pool and everything else there. So, you know, if, the, if there is money available to invest in Crystal Palace and the Mayor of London wants to make that investment, is that potentially the solution, that it is just a high-performance centre for elite athletes uh, in London, in the south of London, in the southeast of England. That that could be the way uh, of dressing up the saving of the Crystal Palace trap. But yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think we've got a fantastic venue in Birmingham. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the European Championships mm. coming there. We've got brilliant um, indoor stadiums as well around the country. Glasgow does a terrific job of hosting indoors as well. And then the London Stadium can step up once a year to host the anniversary games and, well, who knows, hopefully a European Championships, maybe a World Championships, and maybe a 2026 Commonwealth Games <laughs> at the London Stadium. Who, who knows? That, that, that might be the future. Talking of running in London, the Vitality London 10K is back, the 10,000 metres in September. It's the home of the British 10K Championships for men and women. And Ellis Cross, the club runner who famously beat Mo Farah in 2022, returns to the roads of London this year. The 2023 event returns to its traditional fast, flat and stunning route through central London, past the landmarks like St Paul's, Bank of England, Somerset House, Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, you know the drill. Uh, the day before, on Saturday, September 23rd, the Vitality London 10,000 will also see thousands of people of all ages and abilities take part in the Vitality Westminster Mile. It's great to see running back. And I also think, while we record this, Mo Farah's coming back to run in London as well, isn't he? <laughs> Another farewell. For, more, more farewell dates than Sir Elton John. <laughs> and, and whilst we record this at the end of July, and I look out of my window to see some sunshine at the moment, we do have news about the Winter Olympics before we finish. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, because they have confirmed the Paralympic medal programme and quotas as well. So the International Paralympic Committee has set out what events will be at Milano Cortina for the 2026 Paralympic Winter Games. There will be 79 Paralympic medal events across six winter sports and a new medal as well. And it's good for Great Britain because of our history. Wheelchair curling mixed doubles is being added for the first time at the Paralympic Winter Games. We can't wait for the, the Malina, M Milano Cortina 
Cortina 2026 uh, Olympics and Paralympics. It won't be that far away, will it? It really won't. <laughs> It will soon loom into view. For much more about our summer of sport and maybe a bit of winter sport as well, check out our sporting calendar. All our latest blogs, including that blog from John that he spoke so eloquently about a short while ago about the inclusion of Russian and Belarusian athletes at the Olympic Games. You can read all of that on our website at anythingbutfooty.com. And as ever, you can get in touch anytime at anythingbutf on Twitter or anythingbutfooty on Instagram, on Facebook and also on Threads. Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.